passage will be John chapter 5, verses 30 through 47. I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. If I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who bears witness about me, and I know that the testimony that he bears about me is true. You sent to John, and he is borne witness to the truth. Not that the testimony that I receive is from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. He was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. But the testimony that I have is greater than that of John, for the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing, bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. His voice you've never heard, his form you've never seen, and you do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe the one whom he has sent. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. I do not receive glory from people, but I know that you do not have the love of God within you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you've set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Father, we gather in the name of Jesus this morning, and we are thankful, we are grateful, and we praise his most holy name. I thank you for the message of peace that is in the cross. I thank you for sending your one and only son like you did. Father, strengthen our belief. May we see maybe where we disbelieve. May we see maybe where our belief is weak. And may you strengthen us this morning. I thank you for your word. And though it is complex and hard to get sometimes, I pray that we would make the effort, that we would labor with all of our might and dig, seek to understand, even though it is work. Praise you for what you show us, Lord, and pray that you would show us many things this morning to the praise of your most holy name. Build us up, strengthen us, equip us to do your work, your will. In the name of Jesus, our Savior, we pray. Amen. The title for the sermon this morning is, If You Believed Moses, The Structures of Belief and Justified Reasons for What We Do Believe. Oh yeah, kids, you can leave. You know, I don't really have to tell them to go. They just, they know what's up. Like, I ain't listening to this dude, I'm out of here. Somebody way more entertaining over here that has a snack. That's probably what I should do, have snacks, and then we could have a competition. See, how many kids I keep keep in here? I want to talk about belief this morning, and again, I'm, I'm thankful that this belief sign was put up here. I had no intention of this, this is what has been preset and had no intention of doing that. It just got done, and I think it's awesome because we are called to believe. And at some point, we are watching the Polar Express in which the believe ticket will be punched. And I, I kind of think that the complexity of what belief is and is not, we need to go through it because it's, it's present right here within this passage in particular when he gives them the indictment at the end, and basically said, if you believed Moses. Now just put yourself in that scene. you got the Pharisees, you've got the scribes, and he just said, if you would have believed Moses, they may have been like, oh, like scoffed, like, really? 
If we believe Moses, we believe Moses more than anybody. I think what it demonstrates is the structures of belief are complex because they were under the distinct opinion that they believed. So let's go through this little exercise real quick of what belief is and is not. And I'm going to use the refrain, belief is more than. Okay, Belief is more than thinking something is true. Belief is more than thinking something is true and thinking something is true without action. All right? Think about this. I can think that it is good to eat clean. Now, if you don't know what that is, that's not eating at McDonald's, though it be delicious, right? It's like eating kale and broccoli by the handfuls with white rice that has no flavor in it, and you need to cook a chicken breast with no bone or skin or fat and make sure it's nice and dry that it seems to suck the life out of your face when you eat it that's eating clean right and you can believe or think that it is good but the fact that a lot of people don't do it demonstrates they don't have genuine belief you can also think early to bed early to rise makes a man healthy wealthy and wise and like most of the people within our culture, you use modern convenience and technology to stay up late to go to, to bed or to, to go to bed like late, way later than you should and to get up way later than you should and then wonder why you have this, you know, high blood pressure and wonder why you fall asleep midday and wonder why you have all of these health issues. We can think it, we can say it, we probably can repeat it, but do we actually believe it? Well, belief is more than thinking Something is true without action. Belief is more than feeling something, right? I can feel that the Broncos are the best team ever, right? And are they? Oh, oh. Sorry, Ty. Beautiful shirt you have on, brother. But I'm sorry, objectively speaking, no matter what I believe about you know, my team doesn't make it true and doesn't make my belief a legitimate genuine belief it, it equates it more to an opinion right many people have opinions and we like to argue about what realm opinion exists within the belief structure and stuff like that but let me tell you a genuine opinion that the polar express is real i'm excited to watch that movie by the way i love it it, it is a, just, it's, it's a lot of fun with the kids as I'm scoffing at how unreal it is. But the fact is, is it's an opinion regarding something that is fictitious. It's not actually belief because it doesn't have a justified reason for existing, such as there's no like physical evidence that it exists other than some CGI, it's not CGI, I don't know, cartoon, something than just this silly movie that we have within our culture. So I can have this feeling that something is true. I can have it be something that I hold strongly with great emotion, but it doesn't make it belief. It doesn't make it true. Another one is doing. I know that belief is more than doing. Let, let's go to the Pharisees, right? Because if we look at what Jared read us this morning, Jesus' witness, who is he addressing? He's addressing scribes and Pharisees, he's addressing Jewish people, right? These are people that have deeply held, long-held belief structures and systems. And they do a lot. They have a lot of cultural life that doing somehow gets equated to belief. But let me tell you, if you do something, it doesn't necessarily mean that you believe, such as going to church. You can go to church all you want. It doesn't mean that you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you will have life in His name. It doesn't mean that you have genuine faith. Just because you do something doesn't mean you believe, such as... I'm on it this morning. The Polar Express. <laughs> Just because I watch it doesn't mean I believe it. Believing is much more than doing something, doing a long-held tradition. Many people go to Christmas Eve services because, well, that's the, 
Christian-y kind of quasi thing that we do, right? But just because you attend one church service or maybe two by way reason of Easter services, you attend two services a year does not mean that you believe. Somehow in our society, belief has been associated with doing. Well, it's more than that. The next one is an assumption, right? Belief is more than assuming that the earth is round. Now, this one gets a little bit more complicated because you're like, well, the earth is round. Yeah, but there's lots of people that think it's flat, right? And have you ever had a justified reason for thinking that it is round? Well, it just is, Brian. This is a dumb conversation. No, it's not, because you actually probably haven't put in the effort to think about the reason for why it actually is round. I'm not a flat earther, by the way. If there are flat earthers in the audience, you should be offended. Um, The earth is not flat. It is a sphere. It is round. But there needs to be justifiable reasons and actual processes in which we have gone through so we are not just carrying an assumption. Belief is more than the assumption that the sun will rise tomorrow. And you might go, well, reasonably speaking, uh, the sun has never not risen. Well, yeah, but just because I assume that that is going to be the case, that tomorrow will show up, does not mean that it is a belief. It's just an assumption that I carry. We carry many assumptions in life that do not equate to belief. And so we have to, well, be challenged. That's what Jesus is actually doing to the people within Judea and and Galilee and uh, the whole area as he kind of travels up and down and back and forth in this history here as he is challenging those four concepts or, or components of belief, thinking, feeling, doing, and assuming. And oftentimes we think, feel, do, and assume and think that that is equated to belief when belief is so much more. What is belief? Well, I wrote a nice little definition here. Belief is having genuine belief, is to have justified reason for thinking that something is true, and then action according to that belief. So I must Not only think that it's true, but there's a justified reason for why I believe that it is true. And then my belief has to stand in accord with having action that follows. Jesus holds to this definition. Why? Because in multiple other passages that we've covered over, and this one this morning, he gives us justified reasons for why what he is saying is true. And then he calls people to believe in that true base based off of the justified reason, and then have a response to that truth. That response is one of walking by faith. He challenges the people to actually believe. People who would say, no, we believe. We believe, and we believe so hard that we will persecute people, and you will see that in the years to come after Jesus' ministry in which these same people end up persecuting the church because they believe things that are contrary to their thoughts, their opinions, their their actions, and their assumptions, they will actually be killing people for the sake of what they believe in the name of Moses doing it. And here Jesus almost says in a roundabout way, have you never read? These are people that have the first five books of the Old Testament memorized, guys. I want you to grasp how offensive what Jesus is doing here really is. Do you not know? It'd be like talking to Dr. Will over here and being like, don't you know teeth? Yes, the man knows teeth. He stares in your mouths every day. He knows teeth better than anybody in here, unless there's another dentist. I think you're the only one, so there you go. It'd be rather offensive to say, don't you know teeth? Or, don't you know Rumen's doc? He knows Rumen's. You know, got rumens, Doc can tell you about them. Or the list goes on. There's many of us in this room that it would be relatively insulting if we pointed to, you know, Justin, don't you know trucks in construction? I mean, I can go around the room. The fact is, he calls into question their belief. And so as we go through this, I not only want you to see that question of belief, but I want you to do something. Question your own belief. And you're like, no, no, wait a second. 
I thought you were supposed to be a guy that encouraged belief. I'm not here to be having doubt drawn into my mind. Isn't your job to get me to believe? Uh, kind of, yeah, it is to get me to believe or to get you to believe. I want to encourage belief. But I often find that many people within the church sitting listening to the sermons that I have, they're going to carry one of those four kinds of beliefs. I think, therefore it's true. I feel, therefore it's true. I do, therefore it's true. I assume, therefore it's true. No, God gives us justified reason for why we can hold Him to be who He says He is and then act accordingly. And my question to you is, do you believe that? Do you believe that? And does that belief carry out? I think many of us are in the position of the guy that was you know, praying, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Somehow we think that's a distinctly unspiritual position to take, but I think that if we're honest with ourselves, there, there's corridors of unbelief within our own heart. And we, like the psalmist, need to be praying and thinking as we come and engage in this together, Unite my fragmented heart, Lord, to fear your name. Unite my fragmented heart. Unite the fact that sometimes I'm scattered in the way that I think, feel, and act. And Lord, bring that all together underneath the reality of who you are and what you've done and how you've shown it to us. I think very often we come to a passage like this in John and we get lost. Because it's actually deeply complex. It's one of the most simple renderings in all of Scripture, just for the word length and the way everything's connected together. But there are so many propositions placed in here that, that you get three or four verses in and you're like, man, I'm not even sure what's being said anymore. I read this passage dozens and dozens of times for the last two weeks just to try to get the sense of it. Just to try to get what is actually being said. And what is actually being said is beautiful. Jesus comes back again and He says, here's the reason I'm saying this to you. I'm giving you justified reason that you might act upon it so that you may be saved. Verse 30. I can do nothing on my own. Talking about His submission to the Father, His relationship with the Father, His oneness with the Father. I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge and my judgment is because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. He comes and he is saying this judgment. He is stating these things to these people about their lack of belief, about their misunderstanding, because he is doing the will of the Father. He is not only doing the will of the Father, he's doing it as a subservient. It's phenomenal. He's not coming and saying, listen to me because I'm me. He's saying, listen to what I'm saying because the Father has sent me. The authority is from on high. He continues on. If I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. Right there, if there is not justified reason and I am just standing, spouting all on my own, disconnected from anything and everything that God has, I am merely spreading this falsity and seeking my own glory. Jesus, very clearly, is not just standing bearing witness about Himself, but He's pointing to someone greater. Jesus isn't just standing there as a flash in the pan. Jesus didn't just show up on the scene, but God had been preparing the way for him for hundreds of years previous, leading up to this time, and then had many things to bear witness about him. Think about what we're going to be reading on uh, Saturday night. Right? We're going to be reading the Christmas story. What happens in the Christmas story? You got shepherds in the field watching their flocks by night and the glory of the Lord shone all around. Glad tidings we bring. Okay, you guys get it, right? Shepherds there, angels show up. Hey, go see this baby. Here they go. What do they begin to point to? They begin to bear witness and testimony to God sending His Son. 
And the entire story is about that. And that testimony is borne witness in Mary. It's borne witness in John. It's borne witness over and over and over again through the years. So more than just Jesus is standing and saying, I am this, everything is pointing to Him. From the prophets of old to the prophets at this time. He continues on, verse 32, There is another who bears witness about me, and I know that the testimony that he bears about me is true. John, the forerunner, the forebearer, the one who came before to point to Jesus, the one who must decrease and have Christ increase, he's saying his testimony is true. He then continues on, You sent to John. Now stop, that might be a confusing statement for some of us. Some of us. What do you mean? Well, when John was out ministering in the desert, they sent like an envoy or a group of people to see what he was talking about. Hey, go figure out what's happening over here with John. They sent to him to inquire what's going on here, right? So, verse 33, you sent to John and he has borne witness to the truth. Not that... Not that the testimony that I received is from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. I say these things so that you might understand the testimony that has been born about me. I say these things so that you might understand that I came to seek and save that which is lost. I say these things because God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Me shall not perish but have everlasting life. I'm saying these things that you might hear, that you might see, that you might know that I am the Savior and King. And this is not just a one-time passing fancy, but this is a justified reason for why we might continue to believe. And how did they respond in their belief to this testimony? Verse 35. He, John, was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in His light. I almost brought the parable of the seed and the soils. I mean, really, that that could apply here. But their belief was short and momentary. It was a plant that grew and lit up and then burned and fizzled out. And oftentimes we have this manner of pharisaical belief and response. We have a religious movement. We have some excitement. We have a new preacher in town or we have a new program in town or or we have a new this or that. There have been so many different movements within the history of the modern church, let alone the church throughout history, that mankind just get excited and the new fad and the new wave of whatever, and what I mean by new is something that might happen over the course of 100 to 150, maybe even 200 years of time. But as they get excited about that, that excitement often fizzles. I want to know where all those Jesus freak hippies are now. Do you know what I'm referring to? There was a time back on the West Coast in which there were, you know, the Azusa Street revivals in which they had this massive, you know, pseudo Pentecostal eruption of, of different people that were coming to faith in Jesus Christ. And it, man, it was the thing. Be a hippie and love Jesus. <laughs> I love Jesus, man. Right? And. Where are they today? They've fizzled out. And many of the people that were major prominent players within those. And those movements have fallen hard. They've not actually enduringly ministered the gospel and finished well. It's because it was more about the light and momentary excitement that they had. They saw a bright and shining light and they got excited about it, but it fizzled. I don't want my belief to be like that. I don't want your belief to be like that. I see that often with myself. And I'm not talking about my own belief. I'm talking about the way people respond to me. People really like me at times at first. And then they get to know me. And they're like, oh, oh, yeah, you're always like this. Yep. And it's tiresome. They're like, I don't feel like showing up every Sunday and getting yelled at. Not yelling. 
Yelling from me is different, all right? I tell you, I'm Jojo the Idiot Circus Boy. I get excited and I talk loudly. And that's okay. That's okay. But I see people get excited about that, but they're not really excited about what I'm saying. They might be excited that I'm excited. I don't know if you've ever heard a bad joke before. All right? Silas told us a bad joke this morning. Nobody laughed except for me. And then as I laughed at it, because it was glorious, Silas, it was glorious, everybody else started laughing in the room. Why? Why do you think everybody was laughing? They were laughing because Pastor Brian was laughing, and they're a bunch of kids. And so what happens? It's an uncontrollable thing where everybody kind of moves with for a period of time. But then the laughter turned and, <laughs> why are we laughing? That wasn't funny. Belief often operates in similar structures and it's a detrimental and damaging thing when you believe in the light momentarily and then it kind of fades away. Don't believe in the light momentarily. Believe in the light and believe in the light even when it gets hard. E even when there are things that are said that are like, I don't know about that. That confronts my belief system. That confronts what I think or what I feel or what I've been doing or what I assume. Well, rejoicing in the light momentarily leads you to a pharisaical position. Verse 37. Actually, sorry, verse 36. But the testimony that I have is greater than that of John. For the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I'm doing, bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. So, you believe momentarily in the light that John gave, and guess what? My testimony is greater than his. And I'm talking about the testimony of Jesus. Jesus is saying his testimony is greater than what they momentarily gave credence to. And the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. His voice you have never heard. His form you have never seen. And you do not have his word abiding in you. For you do not believe the one whom he has sent. Now right here, Jesus begins to get offensive. You, you don't believe. You don't have the Father's word in you. What is one thing that they had the market cornered on? The Father's Word. They, they believe the Father. And what he's saying is, you had a, this short and momentary belief in the light that John was giving. I'm giving greater testimony than he gave, and you don't believe it. If you don't believe that, you don't believe the Father. I think the equivalent in our day, because we don't have Pharisees just running around with their robes and phylacteries and, and stuff like that. The equivalent in our day, of those who would believe in such a way that they would have this refusal to repent, if you will, this rejection of Jesus, if you will, is those that think they have a Jesus, but they refuse to submit to the Jesus. What do I mean by that? Well, we have many groups and people that give their interpretation of who he is. When you bring the Bible to them and say, well, this is who he says he is, they reject it. They reject it. That is rampant in our Western civilization. I think I have a corner on Jesus, and I'm even talking about people more than the Mormons, more than the Jehovah's Witnesses, more, more than, than the Rastafarians who have a form of Jesus that they believe in. He smokes pot in their universe, but it, it's way more than that. I think it's actually even people who claim to be evangelical Christian, have a form of Jesus. Many people that we might include in that is the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel people that have created Jesus to be kind of like this heavenly Santa Claus. And if you're really good, and you do really well, Jesus will give you good things. But if you don't have enough faith, and you're not quite good enough, He's not going to give you good things. And, and here's the thing, my friends. What if you happen to be faithful? 
What if you happen to be diligent in prayer and the Word? And you love Jesus more than anything. And yet, your lot would be like one of the apostles. Boiled in oil. John must have not really loved Jesus that much, right? He was boiled in oil. Or Peter, who is probably crucified upside down. And the list can go on of those who have been martyred for the name of Christ and who have suffered. And, and we have an entire group of religious thinkers and people that actually say, well, they weren't doing it right. And, and they obviously didn't believe enough. And they, again, they created Jesus to be this heavenly alms giver, whose greatest good is the maintenance of my freedom of choice and me getting the American dream. God's greatest good is not me establishing my 401k. God's greatest good for me is not me having all the stuff that I want or even achieving all my realized purposes and goals in life. That Jesus is a different Jesus than the Jesus of the Bible. The Jesus of the Bible loves us. He loves us and He knows that the Father works all things together for good for those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. But do you know all those things work together for good? Could be bad things? You could have cancer and perish because of that. There are people in this room that suffer through that now. And you're going to tell me that they don't have enough faith? You want to fight with me. It's nonsense. People love Jesus more than many people I've ever met. Our Jesus is not heavenly Santa Claus. He is one who is infinitely trustworthy and is exactly who he has said that he is here. And my Desire is that we grasp that, that we might not have this refusal to repent as they had here. They did not believe the one who sent. They do not have his word abiding in them. They don't know the word. It even says here, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. Many people wave this around saying, I've got it, I've got it, I've got it. And yet they punt it as fast as they can, demonstrating they don't believe what it actually says about Jesus. They thought this, yet, verse 40, you refuse to come to me that you may have light, yet you refuse to repent. I have found and witnessed many a man who wants to love the claims of Jesus but has a refusal to repent. They want to love the promises. Hey, I want to go to heaven. Who doesn't want to go to heaven? Or your version of heaven. Who doesn't want good? I've never met somebody that's like, you know, I'm just really into bad things and I just want only bad for myself. And I hope today goes worse than yesterday. Nobody has ever said that. And if they are and have, they are unwell. They need Jesus even more. The fact is, is that the refusal to repent is a refusal to believe and actually hold Jesus to be he, who He says He is. Verse 41. I do not receive glory from people, but I know that you do not have the love of God within you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? I love Jesus. I really wish I could have walked around with him. Because our culture hates what he just said. And not only do they hate what he just said, they hate the way he said it. We live in a society that it's not okay to say that. It's not okay to, to go, you don't believe. You are not walking in this truth. You have actually refused to repent and you seek glory from men. Why don't you seek glory from where it's 
given. Why don't you seek glory from where it comes? It is terribly offensive to tell somebody you are not a believer. I have felt that tension and unease so many times as I'm sitting there counseling with people or talking to people and I'm like, I hate to tell you this. But do I really hate to tell you this? No, I want to tell them that so that they might actually come to know the one true king. You don't know Jesus, my friend. You don't know him. You haven't repented. You've refused to repent. You've refused to believe that Jesus is who he says he is and you keep forcing something on him. Christian, have a boldness to say that. But the boldness to say that is the same boldness or, or the same you know, gear that it takes to become confident that you know that that's actually true. And you don't, won't have the ability to know that's true unless you actually search the Scriptures and see Him in it. Unless I'm actually a person of the Word and can dive into this, because here's the thing, you search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. That's awesome. They do well to do that. But what do they do even though they search the Scriptures? They don't believe the one that it testifies. If you want to be able to speak like Christ did for the sake of your brothers and sisters, for the sake of your mothers and fathers, for the sake of your neighbors and co-workers, for the sake of your community members, you need to be people of the Word that know that the Word points to Jesus. He continues on. Do you not think that I will accuse you to the Father? There is one who accuses you. Moses on whom you have set your hope. I want you to take the time just to think about that. Spend some time as you read your Bibles this week. Think how offensive what he just said is. Think about how terror-stricken they must have been and angered by the fact that he says, Moses indicts you. The very Scripture indicts you. It calls you to the carpet and says you don't believe. Moses says you don't believe. Because what did Moses do? He wrote the very first five books of the Bible that they had committed to memory. They held Moses up in the highest and greatest regard. And he says you have no concern for him. For if you believed Moses, you would have believed me. For he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? I think it demonstrates to us a multitude of things. One, the Old Testament is very useful. It is useful. Know your Old Testament. There's not a dichotomy between Old and New. It's not like Old Testament is Jewish Scripture and New Testament is Christian Scripture. Old Testament and New Testament is Christian Scripture. And it bears witness about Jesus from Genesis to Revelation. Read it, know it, all of it. Not only that, it demonstrates that somebody can ardently, just vehemently, hold to something traditionally, long term, and not genuinely believe. That is hard. That talk, For me, this week, I'm like, alright Lord, where's my unbelief? Am I like the Pharisees? Have I created my own Pharisaical stance and movement? And I've been studying this passage actually for two weeks because I was going to preach all of that in one section last week. And I just, it's too much. But I've been begging my own, the, the question that I'm going to ask you to ask, where is my belief? Am I just holding on to it because I've always, this is what I've always done. This is what I believe. Or am I actually searching the Scriptures and seeking to see the one whom they bear witness about and then seeking to make that change in our life? Because let me tell you this. Before I come to faith in Jesus Christ, before you came a Christian, before you came to understand that Jesus is your Savior, you thought, acted, felt, and assumed a bunch of things. 
a bunch of things. And when you come to faith in Jesus Christ, that repentance, that turning from something to something, and that something to which you are turning is Jesus, is not something that happens oh, like that. While it might happen in a converting fashion, immediately and instantaneously, you weren't a Christian, now you are a Christian. The fact is, is it is a lifelong process of continuing to move that thinking, that feeling, that doing, and that assuming away from what it was and what the world wants to cultivate it to be. It is so easy to fall back into the bad habits of thought and feel and do and assume. So easy. I see myself do it and I watch you do it. And the thing is, is we need to continue to have our minds transformed and not conformed to the world. And our minds are going to be transformed by the renewing through His Word. Our minds are going to be conformed, which is going to strengthen our belief. I want to be that old gray man, like, not really, but I know it's coming, so I might as well embrace the inevitable. Um, but I want to be that gray old man who has more faith in the latter years of his life than I do right now. I don't want to allow the pain of loss and suffering, the pain of aging and disease to strip me of what I have now and to make it less. As I mature, I want to be that father that my grandchildren can come to and say, Grandpa, what do you think about this? And I could say, well... The Word says, and my experience with the Lord has shown me, and here's where my belief rests. And I'll pray for you the same, grandson, granddaughter. And you know the thing is, I want that for you too. If you don't want it for you, I'm praying it for you. You better get out of the prayer's trajectory. I'm praying that for you. I'm praying that we might have genuine belief that is established off of a justified reason that leads us to action that is faith-filled, that is gospel-believing, Jesus-trusting, Lord-loving, help me please, maturing in faith, not as perfect people, but those being sanctified into His likeness. And so my hope and prayer, friends, again, is that you become people of the Word. Search the Scriptures daily to see if these things are so. Be like the Bereans, those who faithfully dig in, pursuing Jesus with every bit of their being. May we be that. Father, we thank You for this morning. Thank You for Your goodness to us in Jesus Christ. I thank you for the belief that we possess that you are the Son of God. That Jesus, the Son of God, came to this earth, lived the perfect life, and died upon a cross. He was taken down, he was buried, he then rose from the grave. Death could not hold him. He rose from the grave to sit at the Father's right hand. And all things have been put in subjection under His feet. And by faith in Him, with Him as our Lord, we know that we will be saved, trusting in Him to take our sins upon Him and grant us life in His name. Father, may that belief carry through and permeate into every corridor of our lives. Father, work in us in this way, please, we ask. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen.